Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. The text for the third Sunday after Pentecost on June 26, 2022, are these. The thematic first reading is 1 Kings 19, 15 through 16 and 19 through 21. The alternate or semi-continuous first reading is in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 2 and 6 through 14. Psalm 16, Galatians 5, verse 1, and then verses 13 through 25. And from Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, 51 through 62. Major, so, go. Oh, well, this is like a pivotal moment, right, in Luke. This is big, big, big deal. and. So, so much uh, going on here and, and a number of themes that one can, a preacher can lift up. Uh, but I, I want to, I want to start with just the narrative space in Luke that is given to the journey. That, because this is the, and you, the commentary Commentaries will talk about a commentary. This is the, you know, the Luke and travel narrative, right? And so 951 through 1948, but 10 chapters given to uh, that journey to Jerusalem. And I, that, that in and of itself is something to think about uh, in terms of what does it mean to, uh, what does it mean to follow Jesus? And what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? And what does faith look like? Uh, that, and you think about all the stories to pay attention to all the stories along the way and how, for, how the emphasis is on this formation and this transformation. Uh, not that the destination is not important. Clearly it is. Jerusalem, Jesus has to go to Jerusalem and, and for, uh, for the fulfillment of his ministry. And that's, and that's where uh, he will be taken up, lifted up, uh, crucifixion, ascension. Uh, resurrection as well, uh, but uh, but just to uh, think about that that narrative emphasis and what difference does that make to to how we how we understand or how how we live into uh, what faith means and that and not that I necessarily want to just only focus on this metaphor of journey because that can get a little old but is there a way to uh is there a way to unpack that homiletically that really gives people insight into what does it mean to follow jesus uh and and it takes seriously that narrative space that luke gives us that's my first comment i love the idea of doing the journey of echoing the fact that um, that is um, more where we live. Um, if you're starting to travel again, um, you are reminded that in order to get to the destination, you have to go through security and you got to deal with the ticket counter and you got to deal with the other passengers. And, you know, the journey. <laughs> is where all the stories come from. That's where all the events happen. And uh, having binge watch um, the Marvel Universe, um, there's a repetition in all the metaphors that those particular stories are telling. So I'm not willing to say that the journey metaphor has to get old. It just challenges us as preachers to make sure that we're being creative to keep that metaphor alive. Yeah, I think homiletically and how you how we kind of help pull a congregation into this is, well, to let them know, first of all, that you, get, you already have 10 chapters of a journey, but in those 10 chapters, you've got, uh, that's where most of the, the primarily Lucan material sits. So you're going to get a lot of stories you don't see in other gospels. And the lectionary creators choose almost entire, not entire, but the preponderance of Luke-only material which means you get a lot of parables as well. So you're gonna get, and even some non-parabolic stories, things that technically aren't parables, but almost function in the same way because the demands are so high and the depiction of discipleship is so counterintuitive or just so weird. So it's partly, you know, strap yourself in for really encountering a different society or a different way of 
inhabiting this world and and being there and that's in some ways it starts off a little bit tamely because they're just simple um statements from jesus little teach little short pockets of teachings or aphorisms but they're really tough right i have nowhere to lay my head right let the dead bury their own dead you proclaim the kingdom nobody who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit so already the bar is <laughs> rather high and it's it sounds um excessive it sounds a little radical it sounds cruel it sounds like it's going to make you a bit of a cultural misfit um so to play with that and instead of apologizing for what he says here or instead of making a joke and then good thing we're saved by grace you know and cue the hymn but just to sit with a bit that with this a bit and ask what kind of why does he present this alternate society it's partly because the one we dwell in is so messed up and it's partly because the kingdom of god just does not function according to all of these normal canons and rules and norms and you have to relearn everything it seems um in ways that will sometimes paint you as the the perpetrator uh or the one in need of of you know stopping what you're doing or reframing your values so anyway it's just uh, somehow you've got to just really get people ready for some alternate ways of thinking and viewing, which I, we've talked before is what I think repentance is in Luke Acts, right? It's to totally have your mind rewired. Mm -hmm. And it, it, and also not only that, but it, here clearly there's an invitation to, well, how will you respond to what Jesus says? And, uh, you know, follow I'm gonna me. I'm going to burn down the villages. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> The villages that don't make life easier for me. Yeah, uh, yeah well, yeah, good idea. Uh, and and what excuses, right? Um, <laughs> follow follow me, but first. But he said, "I will follow you, Lord, but let me first. And uh, I that could be a really, I think, provocative refrain in a sermon. Uh, follow me, but wait a minute. Follow me, but first. Follow but. me. The, but, the sermon title is just but. But. <laughs> but, but however, however, yeah. Uh, but that's it. It it really does kind of point to what are those? Uh, what would be our response? And what are some of those? Uh, what what are not only what are some of those excuses of not following Jesus, but also what are our excuses for not embodying what this new kingdom is about? Uh, how do we how do we wiggle out of the responsibility and the accountability of what of what Jesus is asking us to see, and the kind of uh, the kind of realm that He's asking us to uh, not only to be in but to uh, uh, to proclaim and to live out. Uh, so it it's an important it's an uh, it's a really important passage I think for people to where a preacher could have people think about that. I like the title, but it would I fit on a marquee that. sign too. It certainly would. I like that. Uh, and uh, if I were going in that way, uh, the question I'd want to uh, have as the challenge is um, all is a recognition that all of these um, excuses. Um, are good distractions. They're good reasons. I mean, these are the things that are important to be done in our social life. So the question that I would like to ha hang as the challenge is, is God enough? Um, is God's good enough? Or is God good enough? Because the buts that we put before become distractions from us totally surrendering to God. So if I went in that direction, that would be the focus. But as I was reading this time, uh, I, I had another um, uh, verse that I've often turned to come to me in a different way. And that's verse 54. I've often uh, stated that as I go through this text, um, basically as this is what they want, James and John wanted to do. Shall we, you know, rain down fire? But when I read it this time, I recognized that this is presented as a pause. They say to Jesus, Lord, do you want us to command fire down? 
And, and I want to present that as a possible way of going into this text. And that is to say, are we telling God in our prayers and our requests what we want? Or are we genuinely surrendering to say, here's my proposal, but is that what you want to do? And I didn't mean to say but in there, but I really do like this uh, but but uh, question, but to, to, okay, get the butts out. <laughs> uh, but this idea here of rather than telling God what we think the answer to our prayer should be, to say, this is as much as I've got to offer. Is that what you want us to do, Lord? Because that puts us in a position of surrender. The, uh, we should maybe look at the Old Testament. So it's it's a weird collision of the two lectionaries where the, the thematic actually pulls from what was last week's, or it shows up at the very end of what was last week's semi-continuous, but yeah. they're both about Elisha and kind of how the, the transfer of the prophetic mantle is going to take place from one to another. Maybe we should start with the, the thematic one, which is where um, we see this, what looks like for Elisha to be called. And Elisha not only is willing to not look back when he's plowing, he decides to to barbecue all the oxen just to, <laughs> this is, we talked about this in years fire. past. Yeah, this is like, not only am I not coming back, you know, I'll make sure there's no oxen here for me as well. It's, it's this dramatic sense of being, uh, you know, what the poker players would call all in, right? This is, here you go. I'm not keeping this, that boat in the garage so I can go fishing when this is over. Yeah, no, it's like, <laughs> I'm going to throw the greatest going away barbecue. I mean, I hope that people read this as funny back in the day, because it is a it kind of, it's an excessive story, right? It's, there's an abundance to it that's like, I, don't, I, I, I hesitate to talk about the wedding at Cana, because because <laughs> I think people know why uh, who, where that could take the conversation but there's something about like if this is my call this is what we're going to do this is, we're doing this 100% but. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and such a con converse to what we get in Luke mm -hmm. yep. yep what do you mean in terms of the like, in, in terms of all in versus the hesitancy oh of the people yeah but but first right right but first yeah yeah what do you want to go to the semi-continuous now we probably should yeah the transfer yeah. of the mantle the transfer of the mantle uh and i uh it's it's a great story uh it, but uh no not but yeah. and <laughs> You put that and, <laughs> yeah, no. And uh, I think my first reaction this year with this text was recognizing like how many transitions there have been with regard to uh, pastoral leadership. You know, on Facebook, I'm like, you know, started a new call here and start a new call here. And, uh, and that that responsibility of passing the mantle or having the mantle pass to you and maybe for a preacher to think about that who who did that for you what did it feel like uh what when did you know that uh whose mantle did you take on whose legacy are you are you in uh embodying in your ministry kind of to think about uh I don't want to use necessarily the word mentors because yes, they were mentors, but they're, they're people that like, I, I just think of that mantle that you feel clothed in, you know, that you feel like uh, they're you, how you, part of how you go about in the world is, uh, is with that, with that person's um, spirit or presence or sensibilities or, or legacy. And, so that's the first thing I thought of, like, uh, and to, and, and maybe we invite your congregation to think about that as well, but it, uh, but for a preacher, especially, uh, who, who's with you, 
uh, who, who, whose spirit, whose legacy do you, um, especially when, and, and when we look at and transitions in, um, in our society, in our nation and leadership and what that, what that looks like. So, yeah, that's kind of a different sort of sermon, but, uh, but something that, I, I, that really, really meant a lot to me it was really meaningful to think about that personally. I may, I may have told this story because I think this is a uh, second time around um, uh, approaching this text comes up uh, in a couple of years. Um, but uh, I had to preach this uh, as the first Sunday. Um, it, the reading was in, in July, uh, July 1st. So the first Sunday as a United Methodist a pastor um, taking a pulpit behind a well-beloved, strong preacher who had been pastor for 19 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was terrified. Mm -hmm. And then I got this text and I'm like, oh my gosh, I, 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 I can't, I feel like Elisha behind, I can't, I, I, you know, and uh, a friend of mine said, Joy, it's, about God. And it was, it changed my entire perspective, leaning in from what you're talking about, Caroline, um, because ultimately where I ended was that this text is about God always having a witness. And in a congregation that is losing uh, a beloved pastor, in a congregation where this transition feels like just too much disruption in a couple of years of too much disruption, to be reminded, as the text last week reminded us, that God always has a witness might be the hope that makes this a new beginning, uh, a time of promise and not just a time of memory. And if I, if I say this about another portion of this text, and that is all of the locations that were important places before they were a part of this journey, the places where they stopped had significance in the history of the story of Israel before this journey. And that's what happens when you enter into a new community or a new congregation. You have to go to the places and hear the stories that are significant for them as you take them on the next leg of the journey. Mm -hmm. So two ways to yeah. look at this. I really appreciate those, <clears throat> Joy. I, the, the softened mantle gets taken to kind of symbolize the role or something, but it really is, it's the gospel or it's the message or it's God. And and that's the thing, that's the thing that's constant through this, through all of the weird stuff that happens, it's the mantle goes and the mantle comes back, right? And, and um, which is significant. It's another really good commentary from Daniel Hawk that talks about a lot of that, but it gets to the question of how do we remember transitions? How do we tell those stories? Mm -hmm. And whoever put this together, right, is clearly trying to pull together some of these big um, kind of milestones in Israel's own history and yeah, Elijah has a really wonderful send off and gets to, you know, ride the chariot and all that, but that's really not the point of the story mm -hmm. uh, at all. And so just to think about that and what's the constant, what's the gospel or the witness or the message or the, what's the that that um, has accompanied a congregation before and will continue to do so. So very important. And we're it, nailing the uh, Old Testament. Today, <laughs> I think. And the, the commentary has a great line. The mantle itself symbolizes the continuity of God's work and what has been and what will follow. And yeah. so that's, yeah, that's, that's exactly. And that, and, you know, you're right. Like, you know, taking on that, uh, that response or responsibility or that legacy, uh, when you step back and realize it's it's this continuity of God's um, God's presence and God's witness that uh, yeah. uh, also creates a different sort of sense of 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 what that means for you. So, yeah. yeah. Psalm and sixteen. Those words are in the psalm. Yeah. Yes. That that yeah. this is, this is the God 
in whom we take our refuge. That it, at the end of the day, all of this is a witness to the promises of God. And so we would bless God who has given us counsel that, that, that I, I'm, I'm not preaching on this text because I love the other options of text that we have. And uh, so I'm just gonna use that as the segue to introduce the six, uh, Psalm 16 to say that this reminds us that this is God because I wanna go to the, the uh, Galatians text. Oh, yeah. I yeah. would just say that, you know, with given all of the hard things Jesus says about discipleship in Luke 9, here you've got a text that describes life with God with language of delight, pleasantness, gladness, rejoicing, security, joy, pleasure. Mm -hmm. You know, that, okay, so we've got to find a way to square these two texts or at least put them into a creative conversation. Um, because we probably don't believe that the life of discipleship is nothing but misery stacked on misery. So what is... Mm -hmm. here look at this Skinner's suggesting you have to preach more than one text <laughs> what's happened to me over these how long have you been doing this like 33 years or something <laughs> Galatians 5 God, is God enough is God's good enough is yeah. God good enough yeah. yeah well you might ask have anybody experienced any of these things in church here today if not maybe we've done something wrong so yeah, yeah. Galatians 5, you two were so excited last week to discuss the fruit of the spirit. Yes. Well, but nobody wants to talk about the works of the flesh. No, no. I've seen enough nobody of wants that. A, yeah, nobody wants a sermon series on the works of the flesh. No. You know, it's unfortunate that we can't name those in ways that can get us a hearing right now. Um, because we've made them, uh, if I use the words from last week, they've made, we've made them uh, um, litmus tests or idols uh, that we want to tear down uh, other folks. And so, Matt, I, I'm going to I'm going to lean into your truth telling here that I don't want to preach on the works of the flesh because I just wonder, I just wonder if the preacher conveys what it is to demonstrate this fruit, if that might not take up all of our time. I think it was uh, Mark Twain who said, it's not the stuff in the Bible um, uh, that I, uh, that th it's not the stuff I can't do that's problematic. It's the stuff I'm supposed to do. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this would be the text to say, what does it mean to live out this gentleness, this generosity, this kindness, this patience, this peace, this self-control? Not as steps toward perfection, not as I'm stronger in this area than in that, but in this whole of being the fruit, single as the commentary notes and spend our focus there, we wouldn't have time to get caught up in the things that are problematic for God. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, 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 the other thing, the other verse that I wanna highlight with the Galatians text is the uh, uh, 518. And, uh, and that, and that, uh, that, that phrase, if you are, you know, if you are led by the spirit and uh, which is a, it's better translated, right? Since you are led by the spirit and, uh, and that I, I'm really, I'm, it's, so it's a promise already. You are, I mean, that's the, that's the thing you are, this, you're, it, this is not conditional. <laughs> this is, this is your reality. And but I also really like the verb led, uh, and and I'm not exactly sure what I want to say about that. But I I I it, you know it's lead or bring, and so there's a kind of of um, movement here that is that that these are not just these are not just traits that you have like I'm 
you know, kind or, but it's this kind, it's the way in which you're, it, how you move about in the world or what leads you to decisions, certain decisions that you make or certain behaviors, if that makes sense at all. So there's a dynamism here that is, you know, not just about characteristics that you can list and say, oh yeah, she's really kind or she's whatever, whatever she's very gentle or, uh, but, but it, but it, that, that promise leads you to uh, action and being, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah, well, I think another way into that, verse 16, uh, live by the spirit, um, uh, an imperative, and it's peripateo, literally walk. So mm -hmm. think of halakha, Old Testament, so, I mean, but, and then the NRSV says, live by the spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh, which is a horrible translation. It should be live by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. In other words, mm -hmm. the way into this is to seek this kind of harmonious relationship with the spirit. Mm -hmm. Everything else will take care of itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah.